Ricky Shaleen. There we go, I think. It was Brazil when that was decided upon. Uh, and I stated how pleasant it was to be among one's fellow Celts. And he said, we are not Celts here. This is Lothian. We are Anglos. <laughs> and I said rather injudiciously, just like the English. And he said, no, you must understand. When the Angles came across the North Sea, the acute Angles came to Scotland. The obtuse <laughs> Angles came to Scotland. <laughs> and I think there is a relevance, too, in the differing developments between Wales and Scotland, that we tend to t say devolution, which rhymes with evolution. You tend to say devolution, which rhymes with revolution. <laughs> so you're obviously more <laughs> advanced than we ever have. I've always lived under the shadow of Scotland. I was born in Dumfries Street, and the next street was Butte Street, <coughs> and then the other one was Stewart Street, which is part of the Rhondda estate acquired by the Butte family by the marriage of the third earl to the uh, Herbert heiress of Cardiff. We later lived in Carmarthenshire near an estate acquired by the earls of Corder from the Vaughan family of Getty Iron. And the Thane of Corder used to turn up in lots of meetings. And I used to look at him, I was reading Macbeth at the time. Is this fellow going to kill the present and monarch of Scotland? He didn't actually. Um, then we moved to Cardiff and my <coughs> son bought a house on the estate of the Macintosh of Macintosh, a family which had acquired uh, a large area of Northern Cardiff through marriage with Richard's family of Passmouth. I wrote a book on Cardiff and the Marcuses of Butte, you were kind enough to mention it, available in all good bookshops. <laughs> there, um, and the third Marcus of Butte was an ardent uh, devolutionist, autonomist, using Cardiff money to sustain the Scottish review. He was an autonomist, he said, because he considered the Scottish Parliament be the best symbol of the feudal era of the country's history, a notion which will not recommend itself to you present progressives, I imagine. But he does mention the feudal structure of Scotland, and that's why he wanted the restoration. Uh, but still. And then my links with Scotland culminated by marrying a Mackenzie with family links with the all places court bridge. I went to see the house in which she lived, and the dear old lady that there told me, I wish I could give you a wee sensation. I was wondering what she was up to. Um, but if those in Wales live under the shadow of Scotland, Scotland can certainly be considered the off an offspring of Wales, as Kenneth Jackson emphasised in his book, Scotland's First Poem. That poem, A Godothi, was written in Welsh, or perhaps Platonic, or perhaps Cymric. And I remember standing on the ramparts of uh, Edinburgh Castle declaiming That's a, a distinguished uh, clicking of consonants, which has been the characteristic of King Hane, which has characterized Welsh poetry since the 6th century. Uh, the most distinguished recent um, <coughs> Um, practitioner of King Hanna, it was Geraint Lloyd Owen, and it was gratified to, I was gratified to hear that on his deathbed he insisted that any money raised at his funeral should be given to the Yes campaign in Scotland. And I think they raised well over £500, which is very gratifying. And when you think of the monastic tradition, which was so important in places like Whitton and Iona, it came from Ireland, but it has roots in Wales, in Clanwick Major and St David's. Kentigen, or Mungo, prominent in the church here in Glasgow, uh, was also the first bishop of St. Asset in northeast Wales, so the links are innumerable. Even more remarkable are the links with that noble statement, the Declaration of Arbroath. In 1320, the abbot of Arbroath wrote, If Robert, our king, should yield Scotland and us to the English king, we will cast our king aside and choose another king defend our freedom. Nearly 40 years earlier, the Lords of Snowdon informed the, in the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Prince should not cast aside his inheritance. Let this be clearly understood. His council will not permit him to yield. Even if the Prince wishes to transfer his people into the hands of the King, they will not do any homage to any stranger as they are wholly unacquainted with his 
language and his laws. So I see that uh, the SNP are going to give prominence to the Declaration of Abroad. It might be unkind to point out that it's a piece of plagiarism. <laughs> <laughs> well, Barrett and Wales, admittedly. And despite the defiance of these statements, Wales failed to achieve the regnal status, the regnal solidarity that occurred in Scotland. The explanation is mainly geography. The Scot, Lord Reith, who put in his diary, I do loathe the Welsh. You should have had a discussion with him, I think. Uh, <laughs> he was very proud of the creation of the Scottish Home Service of the BBC, but maintained that similar service could not be provided in Wales because Wales was a mountainous country. One critic of his pointed out, everybody knows, he said, that Scotland is flat. But in a sense, Scotland is flat. I was amazed when you go to the valley of the Forth and the Clyde and the Tay that you do have there the core of what could be a sustainable kingdom, a regnal solidarity. Um, <clears throat> the central belt offers a very level heartland upon, upon which the ancient Scottish, Scottish kingdom could coalesce and which can provide a focus for future ambitions the Welsh and the Scots will embrace. It is the lack of a heartland that explains much of the difference between the experience of the Scots and the Welsh over the centuries. We are not flat. Scotland in key areas is flat. And that's enormously important. Um, Wales has areas of flat and fertile land, but none of them was big enough to provide the basis for more than a mini kingdom. In Scotland, the central belt could provide the basis for a major kingdom fact that explains that Scotland, unlike Wales, was even able to achieve regnal solidarity by the end of the Middle Ages. When I first walked from the castle in Edinburgh to Holyrood House, I was acutely aware that I was at the heart of what was and what could be again a sovereign nation state. Regnal solidarity <coughs> made possible Scotland's ability to maintain four universities when there were only two in England and there were only two in England um, and to create a remarkable network of parish schools to achieve what has been described as the democratic intellect and the development of its distinct religious traditions. Those traditions, particularly the religious ones, had a very strong impact upon Wales. Virtually every leader of non-conformity in Wales had been educated in either Glasgow or Edinburgh. And I remember that my mother once recited the child's confession of faith of our Presbyterian church. I later discovered it was an exact translation of the equivalent catechism of the Free Church of Scotland. Welsh non-conformists who poured contempt on Anglicanism in Wales like to repeat a rhyme they'd borrowed from Scotland. The coal church, the old church, the church that's got a steeple. The wee church, the feast, the church, the church that has the people. The creation of Scotland has been a remarkable uh, achievement, in particular in view of the diverse peoples it contains. Britons and Angles and Gales and Picts and Vikings and a host of people who moved into the country over the last century or two. Scotland is, I think, for the whole of mankind, an inspiring example of a country inhabited by people basing their nationality on civic rather than ethnic identity. Wales perhaps has overestimated the importance of ethnic identity and that has been much eroded over recent <coughs> years. And like Scotland, geography again is central. The country's three major river valleys, the Dee, the Severn, the Wye, they all, all those rivers flow into England offering easy access to Wales as heartland. Consequently, 50% of the population of Flintshire were born in England, 40% of the population of Cardiganshire were born in England, and some of the people who moved in are totally unaware uh, that they live in a different country. Uh, I've always been struck on coming to Scotland that the southern uplands provide a cordon sanitaire for the central belt. There's nothing like that in Wales. Most of Wales' major urban centres are a few miles from the English border, and some of England's major 
uh, the district, Bristol, Chester, Liverpool, virtually abut upon Wales. When the notion of Scottish independence was first mooted, I had my doubts, particularly when the BBC, an organisation which I may say so, has been shamefully biased on the matter, referred to what would be left if Scotland became uh, an independent country. It would be England and its bits, somebody on the BBC. <laughs> Even worse was a suggestion I also heard on Radio 4 on the BBC, uh, that England and its bits would be replaced by former United Kingdom. If you turn that into an acronym, the result can be very unfortunate. <laughs> On, on listening to London-based politicians, I warmed increasingly to the idea of Scotland as a sovereign state. If it's not only in order to shake up the increasingly moribund British state, I'd be very struck by the tone of the No campaign. It reminds me of some of the commentators on Ireland in the late 19th century. They said, anybody who wants to sever links with this, the most wonderful country in the world. And they went on to explain that they really meant Britain or perhaps England. I don't know what they meant. Um, if you're so soft in the head as want to uh, cease to be part of, an integral part of the most wonderful country in the world. And obviously those who are soft in the head can't really handle independence. So they said, the very act of demanding independence proved that you were unfit to have it. <laughs> well, how do you get around that argument? But it was one that was brought up time and time again in the late 19th century where Ireland was concerned. And we are seeing, I think, more than a tink of it in what the law campaigners are saying, uh, too. Uh, in particular, too, I've been disturbed by the comments on the relationship between Britain and Scotland and mainland Europe. Clearly, the Scottish in Enlightenment with its contribution to philosophy, economics, geology, medicine, science, education, and literature, has been central to European civilization. For Europe to reject Scotland is the equivalent of Europe rejecting Europe. And there is a real fear that the rise of UK in England could mean the sundering of Scotland from its friends without the consent of the Scots. Even odder is the dispute about uh, the pound sterling. Uh, sterling was used in the Irish Republic until 1971. It was used in Burma until the late 60s. And the fact that most banknotes bear the word Bank of England is an historic anomaly rather than something set in stone. In fact, if you look back at the history of sterling, you can see how very elastic it's been. In, 1940, in the 1940s, uh, its, its rate of, of interest was fixed by the government. In 1980s, they gave that up. 1990s, they gave that up. So obviously, sterling can be changed. It can be changed then, it can be changed now. The banking system in Scotland had a far more sophisticated history uh, than the system south of the border. Individuals could establish bank accounts and receive interest in Scotland long before they could in England, and all the deposits of the royal family are kept at Coots, a Scottish foundation. Even odder is a discussion of Devo Max, which seems to be based on the notion that independence is a form of devolution. Yet as one prominent politician put it in 1967, power devolved is power retained. Independence is not about devolution, it's about creating statehood on new territory. I've read thousands of letters of the Booth family, and many of them discuss the travels from Glamorgan uh, to Dumfries House in Ayrshire. I wonder if the Marquis met going, somebody going the other way, from Cumnock in Ayrshire to Merthyr Tilbury in Glamorgan. If he had, he would have met Keir Hardy, who became MP for Merthyr in 1900. Britain's first Labour member of Parliament. He was a socialist, an autonomist, and a determined opponent of uh, imperialist wars. You, in the person of John McLean, had a similar figure, and it is above all these two figures, both of them Scots, but one of them much more associated with Wales, um, <coughs> um, 
can it is from these two that our tradition come together. What I fear most is without the shake up of the Morris Band United Kingdom, these traditions could be lost. We may be here facing years, if not decades, of Tory government based upon the bloated wealth of London and the southeast of England, but our future may be dependent upon focus groups in Warwickshire and Kent. It is not, I don't want to live to see that an independent Scotland may force the Labour Party in Wales in particular to rethink its priorities. This may well be the greatest blessing we will have from major change in Scotland. As the results came out on the referendum night of 1997, I was commenting upon them for Radio Cymru, the Welsh medium <coughs> radio station. When it became apparent that Wales would get its assembly, although by a tiny margin, I misquoted Wordsworth. Bliss is it at this dawn to be alive, but to be middle-aged is very heaven. <laughs> I stress the middle age because I remember the horrors of 1979. And I very much doubted whether I'd live to have another chance. Looking around this room, that may be true of some of you. <coughs> so if you don't do it now, you may never see it happening. Of course, the Quebecois have the splendid slogan, if at first we don't succeed, try, try, try again. <laughs> and that might be a lesson for you. But that sort of business can take a long time. And I don't feel I'd be alive to see it. And that does worry me. Um, so... Um, <clears throat> as I say, uh, these things take time, uh, and I would urge you to go for it now, to ensure a yes vote in Scotland. It may be your only chance in your lifetime to restore dignity and responsibility to this ancient land. John, I thank everyone else did too. We have an opportunity to open up for questions or any comments uh, that have been made uh, so far. Let's open it up for questions at the moment if anyone has one. Don't be too shy. Maggie, you're never shy. Maggie. <laughs> this is just to get it going. Yeah. Um, I, I very much enjoyed uh, both the contributions. Uh, they were wonderful, very, very stimulating. Um, I'm from Scottish Socialists for Independence, and, and we have a view that um, the critical thing about uh, us going for independence now at this point in time is about the breaking of the British state. This is the great opportunity to break the British state, finally, to um, remove uh, the, the last vestiges of empire which have uh, so enslaved so many peoples of the world. And of course, uh, Wales and Ireland and uh, Scotland were amongst the most early uh, colonies uh, of that empire. So from our point of view, I, I, I see it as very liberating. And I, I've also watched with great interest the developments in Wales and the strengthening of the independence campaign. D do you feel at this point optimistic that uh, a vote uh, for independence in Scotland would would give impetus to that process in Wales? The term I like to use when we look at Britain is moribund. It seems to me there's all sorts of things wrong with it. It's lopsided in terms of wealth, in terms of class structure, in terms of politics as well. And if Scotland goes, I think it will give us inspiration. If you don't go, I don't know what will happen. So you've got to go. I'm telling you now, you've got to go. And uh, you're interesting to say, you know, when, when Wales collapsed uh, during the reign of uh, Edward I, uh, on the very day, 700 years after his death, uh, there was a compact between Plaid Cymru and the Labour Party to establish a government in Cardiff. I thought Edward the First would be annoyed, and I was glad that the idea that he would be annoyed. Yes, uh, I'm sorry, but I 
don't accept this, uh, which I hear from comrades in the Scottish Socialist Party and others, uh, which we were talking about in the International Marxist Group uh, 30 or 40 years ago. I think to think about what's happening as the breaking up of the British, breaking of the British state, when Tom Nairn wrote about the breakup of Britain, he was talking about the institutions breaking the institutions and uh, the state will continue. States are much more uh, adaptable and flexible than, and speaking as a political historian, uh, than most people realise. Uh, the, the, the British state will adapt. It will still be a capitalist state and <coughs> Scotland will be a capitalist country. Uh, what, I, what I do think is that uh, Scottish independence will give a stimulus to the reshaping of the institutions of the British state. So uh, ending, for example, the doctrine of the sovereignty of parliament. And if we can give the example of uh, a, a nation with a written constitution in which social rights as well as legal and individual rights are enshrined, then that is a way in which the remaining UK uh, could be reformed along the lines that I was working for in Chapter 88 in uh, 20 odd years ago. Uh, and uh, what we're, what's going to happen is not a socialist revolution. Uh, I actually remember Register Bray the man who uh, went to Bolivia to establish that Che Guevara was there and uh, wrote a book called Revolution and the Revolution about guerrilla warfare. He became an advisor to the Mitterrand government. Uh, he said something which I think is very true. Socialism is a retreat, a receding horizon. The, the more we get towards socialist advance, the more the existing state absorbs what we have advised for and, and then consolidates. And it won't happen through that kind of cataclysmic breakup that breaking up, breaking up, that breaking the state implies. It will be a series of strategic advances and consolidation. And, and that's what I hope will happen in Scotland. We will make an advance and we can, can consolidate a much more democratic and socially responsible society in Scotland. And I hope we do it because I think John's right. I'm one of the people who, if we miss this chance, won't see the next chance. May I say, how hail and heart you look. <laughs> I'm sure you've got another generation here. <laughs> but I mean, the point you were making, well, I remember reading about period after the First World War when John McLean, for example, was very prominent and when the Labour Party was developing in Wales, there was hope that something real would come of it. We had, of course, instead the Depression. But if you look at the mid-8, 9, mid-40s, when we had the welfare state, and I remember my mother, we moved to Cardiff by then, insisting that we were taken down to the Ronda to see Vesting Day, when all the pits said, this pit is now owned yeah. by the people. And I thought that was hugely significant. Yes. And it might be step by step, but we were going somewhere then. Now I think we're just going backwards. And that's what worries me. That, I mean, this shape of things to come in five or ten years' time will be worse than they are now. And that's not a pleasant prospect. Yes, and, and what's happening in Scotland now means that there actually is no going back in Scotland. Well, let's hope uh, not. The rolling back of what we achieved in Scotland uh, with the Scottish Parliament is now impossible. And actually, I hope that the Tories don't understand that so much they don't understand. I hope they don't understand that because that could be the rock on which the Tories actually do break if they try to roll back uh, the self determination we've achieved in Scotland. Would you not agree, though, that the removal of Trident is a very critical issue in this debate? And the removal of, removal of Trident will, is a 
situation that seriously challenges Western imperialism. I, I wasn't suggesting earlier that uh, the breakup of um, the, the current state is actually going to take us straight to socialism, but I do think it will create conditions in, in which um, we, we, we can take a whole series of steps that will make us more democratic and open and more supportive of the, the majority of people. But I do think critical to that is the removal of Trident and the determination to have a country that is uh, culturally for peace and, and it removes itself from the aggression of imperialism. Yes, I mean, I, I support the removal of the Trident and all nuclear weapons. I do so on moral grounds as a socialist and a Christian. Uh, I simply cannot accept, I'm, I'm an associate of the Iona community and the Connie Miller community, which works for peace in Northern Ireland. Uh, for me, it's, it's a moral issue. And, and I think the concept of imperialism is a very difficult one. I won't go and have a big argument about it now. But, uh, you know, I taught political theory. And, and uh, if, if you were writing me an essay on it, I would write sarcastic comments. So as well, but from, uh, uh, somehow my students used to treasure the like, sarcastic comments I wrote on their essays. Uh, but I, you know, I, I, I said this to the Kirkcaldy branch, a political education officer of the Kirkcaldy SNP. I said to them at our last meeting a month ago, uh, after independence, Scotland will go into a period of very, very complex and difficult politics. Because then what will happen is there will be a series of parallel negotiations. And the Scottish government has already said that people who were on the no side will be included if they wish to, if they wish to serve the will of the Scottish people, to be involved in those negotiations. Undoubtedly, the issue on which there will be the most pressure for a concession is trident. That means that we have got to stay vigilant. Most of my life has been involved, I've been involved in protest politics, and I don't mind going back to it if I have to. Uh, I, I, I remember, David may remember, the saying of the London branch of the SNP before I left Oxford that uh, uh, I was in the anomalous situation that I now supported the government. I opposed every government since 1951. Uh, now I support the SNP government at Holyrood. And I trust and believe that there is a genuine commitment to get rid of Trident. Uh, but if we are not vigilant, if we are not on the streets, if we're not outside the Holyrood Parliament, when there is the, the slightest tremor of a, of a compromise, then it will be much more difficult for them. They need us not to sit back and say, well, we've won now. We need to be continually pressing and shoving and pushing for, uh, for, uh, for them to be, take a harder line on the issues that really matter to Scotland. John, it was interesting that the Welsh First Minister said, you take the Trident, Miss Iris Hedrick. Well, I was, well, I was appalled by that, I must confess. And he hadn't consulted any of his fellow cabinet members. And Ian, my son-in-law here, and I have every intention of sitting on the road, if it goes in the parade, which is the main centre of importing liquid gas. If that went up, the whole temperature <coughs> would go up. So the idea that you wanted it, he said it's because it will provide work. Well, you'd have to get rid of all the oil refineries and all the gas works and so on, which would lose more jobs than would be lost by having tried in there. Um, I see Devonport is mentioned, but I can imagine some of my friends in England won't want to do in there. <laughs> so they might, if they're going to put it anywhere, they put it on the corner just outside Glasgow. Let them put it on the corner just outside London. <laughs> Um, John, um, thanks for your talk. I wanted to come back to what you said about currency. And I feel like we're in a time when fluidity of currency and who controls it doesn't really seem under anyone's control in Scotland. Um, 
whereas in the past there were kind of negotiations and progressions of the currency in a way that, that kind of gave power to different interests. Um, for me, that's one of the issues, along with Trident, we'll have to be on the streets about. It looks like the current SNP government favours the kind of currency union that, in my view, and I'm interested in yours, but in my view, would take away the ability to, to kind of alter the kind of economic conditions that would allow us to do a lot of what we're fighting for. But I wondered if you might just say a little bit more about whether you think, after a yes vote, we can be quite content with a currency union in the short term, because eventually the, the institutions will play themselves out in a way that will reflect the, the differences of Scotland and the rest of the UK. Do you see what I'm getting towards? Yeah. Right? Well, I'm a friend of mine who is an economist, Every time they said that you'll have to raise interest rates because the economy is overinflating, mm -hmm. they always meant it was in South East England. In fact, he pointed out that if we'd had the same level of interest rates as they had in Germany, we would have done much better because what we need is money quickly and fairly inexpensively. And you know the sort of boom we've seen in London and how we think is highly unlikely to happen with us and probably in most Glasgow. I went to Govan yesterday and I can't see a huge inflation of housing prices there uh, causing a huge increase in, in taxes and so on. Uh, so I think that I prefer to see Scotland doing its own thing. And you know, it's important that we can get doing it. It did have a power in the 16th century, uh, but it was worth. Uh, 0.7% of the English pound. But, I mean, Scotland is more <coughs> profitable now than it was in the 16th century. And it didn't, it doesn't anymore have ideas of creating empires in Daria. They wouldn't dare. So, you know, I think the future of Scotland is very progressive and fairly wealthy. So, you know, I think the whole idea of Tying yourself too closely to London is going to be a horrible mistake. So go for independence of money as well. Anyone else? Yep. No sweat out, John. No sweat out, no your mind. <laughs> um, uh, I, I've been in Scotland for um, nine to ten years now. So well, Scotland's Scott. lucky in that case. Thank you very much. And, and um, I'm, I'm also uh, a yes activist and, and uh, canvassing around the Alexandria region which is a little bit to the north and west of, um, of, of, of Glasgow really, just across, uh, across the hill from, from, from Dunham. Um, it's a very nice place but they're quite working class really. And I've had a career and I've still got my career in psychiatry although that will be coming to an end. So I'm quite interested in the psychology of people really and where we get a very positive uh, response in Alexandria, we do come across a lot of people as well who are of the mindset that, yes, it's dreadful, and I hate having a Tory government, and I never want to see a Tory government ever again, but no thanks, I don't want to vote yes. And I've just got a question, really, but why, because you, you've got an experience, long experience of looking at history and the way people think, why do you think that people allow themselves to, to think in that way? Well, I don't, I've never met to be a Tory, to be honest. And, of course, one must bear in mind that um, this Scotland's got more pandemic clubs than Tory MPs today, uh, which is most promising. Um, I think people don't like change, you know. There is that feeling that if something is set in stone, don't fiddle with it. I found that young people, lots of them, never bother to vote, and they can't see the point of it. I find that very dangerous when we lived in Cardiganshire. My mother was the polling officer. And if it fell below 85%, she'd make inquiries, who's ill? And that was 85%. It was 1945, 1950. And people got quite upset. Now, to get 40 or 50% is considered very good. Um, I think it's a fear of any change. And a fear, well, a fear also that the Scots aren't up to it. You know the idea, if you want to leave this wonderful country, you must be soft in the head. People who are soft in the head can't have independence, so by asking for it, 
you're proving you're incapable of it. Um, and I think there's something like that going on as well. But never apologize that you're living in a working class area. I consider yourself lucky. Oh, why well, not? There we are. Well, I live in Greenwich now. And uh, there's a, well, a more, you can see the whole of the world in one square mile in Greenwich now. And it's a great delight. And you know it too. Yes, I'm an Irish historian, and uh, so I, you know, I, I know a very great deal and a very great deal of detail about how Ireland became independent. And uh, there is no doubt that in 1916, the rebels were highly unpopular. Uh, and uh, they, what they did was com nobody understood it. Part of the reason for that, of course, was because the only way in which they could have a conspiracy that the Dublin Castle didn't find out about was to keep so many people in the dark that it was... But it changed. I remember when Bernard Crick said something very apposite. He said, the key moment was when the town clerks in Ireland started sending their returns to the Doyle Aaron government and not to Dublin Castle. In other words, it was happening at grassroots. People were moving over to the side of the Republic. And uh, part of the reason for that is, again, something I'm, I'm profoundly interested in is... Uh, I'm doing some research on the relation between Scottish and Irish nationalists in London, and they got subsidies from Doyle Aaron. And uh, one of the Rory Erskine of Mar, a famous Scottish nationalist, put forward an idea for a Celtic daily paper to be published in, in Glasgow. And he sent detailed costings to Dublin. And Michael Collins' civil servants, remember this is an illegal government. <coughs> Michael Collins' civil servants looked through these costings and pronounced them to be total rubbish. So that he, he didn't get the money. Uh, and that actually is because at grassroots level, again, they had established an effective government that shadowed the ministries <laughs> that were administering Ireland and where they could ousted those and got the people to support them. And if it hadn't been for that, then public opinion would not have consolidated around the republic. And that's why it's so important that we've got a Scottish government that's committed to independence. It's what you would probably call a dual power situation uh, in which there are two authorities contending in Scotland. And the opinion polls are quite clear at the next Scottish election, almost certainly the SNP will get a majority again. And, and last part, that's partly because of the utter ineptitude of the main political parties, mm. but also because the SNP has convinced people that it can govern. I, mean, I, I was a member of the SNP for 25 years before we got into government. And a lot of the people who are in government are people I knew and students in the youth wing of the party. And I was absolutely flabbergasted at how well they did. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's uh, so, so, I mean, it's like 2011. You could feel that something was happening because people kept saying that the only way you can vote is SNP not only because they recognise that they're the only party that can actually govern effectively, but because everybody else around them was saying it. And that was not the SNP's doing. We could never have got that by simply approaching and convincing enough people personally. People convinced each other in families, in communities, in clubs and pubs. They convinced each other. And that's what I look forward to in the Scottish referendum. That actually when the time comes, 
we will, it will crystallise and people will say, OK, we're going for it. Because going back and accepting the status quo won't be acceptable. Now, that also depends, of course, on intensive campaigning at grassroots level, which we've been doing, and then hoping to achieve that point of takeoff in which public opinion turns. And public opinion has turned so, so tremendously in working class areas. Really. Fife, Labour Fife, Communist Fife, going through these mining towns and people saying yes. Labour Fife, we, we won Kirkcaldy for the SNP. Shouldn't have happened. We didn't expect it to happen. Uh, and uh, I, think I was in the, the yes office in Kirkcaldy on Saturday, and a big guy I, I knew because we've been distributing leaflets, he for the Labour Party, I for the SNP outside the polling station, I actually challenged him and said, let's have a contest to see which of us can sing the most verses of the red flag. He didn't take me up on it. <laughs> uh, I went in to the, the Yes office on Saturday, and there he is wearing a T-shirt saying in Spanish, Liberty, li freedom for Scotland and C, and he's joined Labour for Independence. Well, I'm glad you raised the issue of Ireland because I remember asking De Valera, which is about as good as I can get in name dropping, uh, <laughs> how he is viewed this whatnot. Uh, he didn't say anything, he took his hearing aid out. And then my friend was with me, he said, Why did you start the civil war? And he pressed the button to get us out. But what I liked was, if you looked up the Dublin phone book, President of the Republic of Ireland is there with a phone number. Yes. And, and we phoned him up and said we had students from Wales interested in Ireland. And he is a combo, whatever he had, said, well, come to tea tomorrow then. Yeah. And we did. Uh, but he really wanted to talk about, he was wearing the pointer, you know, and he really wanted to talk about uh, the Irish language in towns. But I think it's a good line. I went back to London and looked at the telephone book there, and Queen Elizabeth II, Queen of Great Britain, didn't have a phone number. I was quite disappointed. Because I wondered if she'd invite me for tea. I knew. Well, I wondered whether I'd go back to it. But still, that's another matter. But well, thank you. What, for what I hope, John, is that uh, sometime in the future, when we get a Republic in Scotland, we'll make you president. Possibly a bit of swap arrangements. <laughs> yes, you send the product, uh, president down to Wales. Well, you were used to with the counties of Caithness and Butte. They were represented in alternate parliaments. So you could do that with presidents too. I have not thought of that. <laughs> I mark out a nice residence. Jason. They're, they're on. After all, we'll do. Uh, mm. Yeah, you mentioned that you felt a lot of people were naturally very cautious of the change and resistant to change. And I think we all know almost all of us can feel like that at times. Doesn't, doesn't that, isn't that the biggest justification? for the currency union, regardless of what we're going to do in the long run, that is, and regardless of its merits, in terms of winning a referendum, it's the least threatening option, given that we know, you know this is already a huge change for people. Well, you're right in a way, but when I heard Darling going on and on and on, all I can say, I was bored. And, you know, I think if you do have it, but I think you're right saying, slowly, slowly, we'll have it later. Um, but there will be huge developments, what we've seen in Ireland. Ireland was a free state and nothing more. It's now a member of the United Nations and has full status as a republic. And uh, I think the same will happen with Scotland. What I don't know, what I'm more worried about, is what will happen to England. Uh, because, you know, when Englishness, is stress, it tends to mean something rather unpleasant. And you know the English, like the Scots, have got an enormous number of things to be very proud of. And you could build on pride in England, and I would hope they do that. So, I mean, we mustn't deflate the English contribution to the world when it comes to health and the creation of institutions and, and well, and all sorts of things. They've been right up there in front. What I don't want is that a sense of Englishness becomes a sense of alienation 
and a sense of disliking everybody else. And that seems to be on the horizon now, long before the issue has got in the road at all. Yes, uh, I mean, I, I, I agree with David. I think that the currency unit is the only workable option. I would much prefer if we had been in a position to go into the euro. Uh, but history meant that we're going for independence at a time when both the banking crisis and the crisis in the eurozone make the issue of currency uh, a very difficult one for, for independence. But I note that actually the, the, uh, it hasn't had an effect on opinion polls. Uh, it hasn't had an effect either of polarising people away from yes or actually polarising people to no. And that says to me that that is not actually what people are thinking about and make up, make up their minds on. I think that's one of the one of the problems of the campaign. Uh, you know, I think the the the, the uh, we and the yes campaign have have not. Actually, I think it's very difficult actually to tune into what people uh, are thinking. I, I, I agree with you about the psychology of it, but it hasn't had a big impact. So far as Englishmen is concerned, you know, I am a great admirer of England. I lived in England for a large part of my had a life, including 20 years in one of the greatest English cities, Oxford, uh, and uh, two years before that as a student at Ruskin College. So uh, I actually wrote a poem about, uh, about uh, my love for Oxford and thinking about, about Buchan as well. I called it distance. I was, I was in one place and thinking about the other. Uh, and uh, I think they're great possibilities for, for, for England. Uh, I, I think that uh, there is a great there's a great democratic tradition in England. There's a great decency of ordinary people in England. There are of course a minority of people <coughs> who are swine and bastards and fascists. But that has everywhere. I don't think they're a majority by any means in England. And all my experience of being Scottish in England is that Scotland is loved and respected, and I don't see that that's changed since we've been government. There may be puzzlement, but not resentment and hostility. And uh, David didn't reveal to you that he's actually the convener of the London branch of the SNP. So we all say to him, go back to London and do missionary work. I have to say that that's my experience when I was down in uh, Brighton for the Unison Conference. Was that there was a number of English colleagues who were saying, go for it, Scotland. So, so my experience is similar to yours. Yes, I know you had a question. Yeah, I was just thinking about your question, actually. The, the question about why people are considering or definitely going to vote no is possibly the most important question for everybody in this room, obviously. Especially people that are active in any way, leafleting or whatever. That's actually the question is, you know, why are people considering voting no? And, and yes, I think it is about a fear of change, but I think the most important word within that is fear. Um, and I think what, what anyone who's talking to anybody, whether it's friends or whether it's knocking at doors, the big question for me has been the extent of the process of political disengagement over the years since Thatcher. <coughs> And the way, the way in which that has finally shaped itself into no common dialogue. And it's, and it's um, the process of talking to people that I don't know about something that, that I'm hoping to persuade them about or listen to what they're saying about what they would like. It's that process that's made me realise that the kind of language that I'm used to using and the kind of experience I've had just through working in a union or whatever it is, about what is collective action, what is the process of discussing politics, that it's absolutely absent in so many people's experience. And therefore, when I talk about a common language, I mean that literally terminology like the Scottish government, devolved powers, the constitution, 
it's not a common, it's not, it's not a common understanding there. And if I can't find out by talking to somebody where they're at on those, what seems to me the automatic language to start the discussion, then I'm not going to understand what they then express as their individual fears or individualistic fears, which are often very, very immediate. They're very genuine, and they're, they, they seem to me very, very um, crude, because it might be, well, but am I going to be using the pound the day after the vote? That no, not knowing that there's even, even on that basis, there's like 18 months to go. People who are not aware that there's a general election within the next year and how that might affect them. Or people who are totally confused about free tuition and believe it's actually something that's been bestowed upon Scotland by the UK government. Those are the kinds of discussions that I'm having with people. So I do think that's a really important question, trying to work out why are people going to vote no? Well, I actually had that experience of someone who didn't realise that the Scottish government had introduced free prescriptions. That this was a 19-year-old person. But they had been brought up thinking free prescriptions. That must have been the UK government did that. So to have these... John, I was going to ask you, in terms of... Um, You've obviously went through a referendum in Wales, where in 1979 it was a heavy loss, the Yes campaign, and had a win for 19, uh, in 1997. And perhaps a similarity in terms of you know some of the uh, reasons that people were voting no and, and that. Is there, is, there any, is there anything you can learn from, from that? And well, I came up to Scotland for the vote in 1997. Yep. And it was rather tedious, you know, you had votes coming in from Thurston and so on, and they were all about 19. And I was rather relieved when I think Shetland and the borders voted against changes in the income tax rate. Uh, and you had at least one or two uh, taking a different line, which was a bit refreshing. But if you look at the vote in 97, it's not all that di this different from the vote in 79 in Scotland, which were you heard. We don't have to be our assembly then, or whatever you call it, uh, by... Uh, blatant Tory fix, but you know, I think Scotland you can look you can look to the idea of a Scottish king, a Scottish kingdom I'm not sure I approve of that but you can look at a history of the sovereignty of a nation. In the Welsh context it's very difficult to put that forward and it's very difficult you know, you had your reformation when there was still a Scottish government and that's it, terribly important. And you had all sorts of things when you could make your own decisions. All I think you should be doing now is restoring that position and making, well, the ladder pass back as good as it was. And also, as we've just been hearing, making Scotland more akin to what John McLean wanted to see. I remember reading with his life, and he was probably the most remarkable Scotsman of the I think, again, it's psychology. I think it's a great deal of it is, is the MMR syndrome. In other words, people don't know how to assess risk. They think all change is risky and the status quo is, stay with the status quo is to, is to uh, be risk free. And that meant that they, when there was a question about the MMR job, they decided not to inoculate their children not understanding that there was a far greater risk to their children than they're not being inoculated. Uh, and they eventually find there was no risk at all for the child. Uh, so people automatically tend to think that change incurs risk. And I think, it, I mean, I remember right at the start of the, the Yes campaign when Shirley Ann Somerville came to talk to us in the fight with Mark Inch, I said, this is a problem. We've got to get people to understand there is risk from the status quo. As one of the, you know, our campaign has been so relentlessly upbeat. It's only now we're beginning to say to people, look, if we don't get independence, there's a real risk to the health service. There's a real risk to social services. There's a real risk of the rolling back of the welfare state and of... <coughs> Uh, and 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 uh, of course the the uh, simple fact is that 
It's not sustainable in the long term. We need to get this across. It's not sustainable in the long term for Scotland to have a significantly higher level of social services. And it's not just a question of the strains on the budget from the block grant. There's also the problem of there being hostility to that in the Westminster Parliament from English Tory MPs who simply think that Scotland ought to snap into line and this has gone too far. So the, the, we need to communicate to people that it's a real and genuine risk. That's what Alec was doing at a broth yesterday, was explaining that the way in which we can ensure that these things aren't rolled back is independence and a written constitution which puts them above simply the will of, the, of Parliament. Uh, 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 that, that, so so, so we, we need to be, be able to communicate to people that what we treasure about the 1945 welfare state that Labour introduced is now threatened by Labour's opposition to independence. Okay. We'll take a one more question, and Scott, I think you want in. Yeah, just briefly, Chris, thanks. Just to thank you, uh, to Bob and John for your speeches now, but excellent. J just to amend my colleague's point for earlier on, I read an article last week, um, I know she didn't say the words were right, it was called Political Illiteracy in, in the UK. Um, it, one of my concerns I've got was about the vote, I mean, I'm actually getting the vote at the day, and the last poll was seen, say, 48, 52, but particularly you mentioned young people joining about the fact that they're no vote, they're no engaging. I don't think there's, a, there's the same level of disengagement in Scotland there is in Australia as the UK poll. Um, my concern, if any, is, is making sure that trying to ensure in the day that um, the people <coughs> and cast a vote because I think it would probably suit the you no know, campaign for people to stay in their beds and no vote. I don't think I would suit, you know, I don't think I would suit the yes campaign. So um, I'm not going to get the realms of the article, but it just struck me a bit. It always amazes me people who say I don't get involved in politics. Um. You can't not get involved in politics. In my view, it affects every facet of your, uh, your life. So... Um, if I've got a concern, it's probably that one. And we make, make sure we, we get the vote out in the day. So. Well, I do remember in, in 79, some leading Tory in Wales saying on the radio, clearly the way ahead is the status quo. And I <laughs> that's <something> <laughs> uh, you know, it, it makes nonsense of the whole thing. But he said it several times, he thought it was a very witty remark, but he wasn't Tory. Um, <laughs> you don't like Tory stuff, do you? Well, anybody from the wrong there hates their guts. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, yes, actually, I mean, on Tories, I, I grew up in Edinburgh. The only people we knew who weren't Tory were our parents were Labour. Everybody else was Tory. Now, Edinburgh's completely transformed. Largely because the, the old inhabitants have been replaced by new people coming in who deserve the city. The old inhabitants, the people I grew up with in Edinburgh, didn't bloody appreciate the city, didn't, didn't deserve it. Yeah. So I, I left Edinburgh in 1961 and came to live in Glasgow for six and a half years. And, and uh, uh, I, I, I uh, will never go back to live in Edinburgh. Mm. Uh, bunch of bloody moaning, <laughs> carping. <laughs> Best thing that sums up Edinburgh to me is I was standing at the top of the mound when the Scottish Parliament was opened and Sean Connery got out. It was where the VIP, was, VIP cards were drawing up. And Sean Connery got out uh, dressing full Highland regalia. And I went, oh, Sean. And he went in and a voice from the front of the crowd said, hey, his kilt's just that wee bit too long. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to say about getting the vote out. It's absolutely crucial. It's something I'm always saying to the Kakadi SNP. I, I, you know, I've been by, I've been Kakadi for six years, and we've had about five elections in that time. And every bloody time we don't get our vote out. 
the Labour Party get their vote out because they've been doing it for years they have systems to do it. Even though they have actually fewer people on the ground than we have, they get their vote out. We need to do it this time. Uh, now I can't run up and down stairs anymore. What I can do is get on the blower. And we need to have the, the yes campaigns all over Scotland need to be thinking now about the organised election day to make sure, first of all, we've identified every possible yes voter. And secondly, that we have arranged who and how is going to contact them to make sure they've been out to vote. I wouldn't mind going back to the Labour Party's old reading system, the, the reading cards of, of taking people off the electoral register. It's not high tech, but it bloody works. Uh, 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 and, uh, but we need to be sure that we, are, and, and we have the advantage that we've got all these enthusiastic, energetic volunteers. Yeah. And, and we need, but most of them, you see, have no experience of fighting an election. So they don't know, so they, we've taught them about leafleting and canvassing and talking to people at the, on, the, on the front doorsteps and in the street. They don't yet know how you get a vote out. And it's desperately important that we're able to do that. Well, one, one thing that's going on with that a lot is um, various stalls and groups everywhere, as you know, obviously, but Women for Independence has been particularly active in that regard. And I've been at a few stalls over the last few weeks, particularly in the city centre. And they have the forms and they have registration. And a lot of people are asking, and they're young people, and I'm thinking, I just... I've always, always voted, and my son is 16, just turned 16. He was born in Darlington, where the Darla mums are going on a walk to London to fight for the NHS, and we're now back here, have been for a good few years. And I just feel so privileged that A, he's got the vote now, he's 16, and B, he's actually going to vote. Got his polling card the other day. But Women for India have been really, really active in this, and I just want to really kind of praise them for that. They've worked so hard over such a long time, and it seems to be working. I see people signing up and asking for information and even saying things like I don't know if I'm registered, how do I find out if I am? Mm. And they have information there and they take it and they read it and they then sign forms and they fill things in. So, you know, just have something to them. Mm. Well, all cameras and like that has been similar in terms of people have to fill registration forms because the number of people who are not registered is quite surprising. And they have to be set in September to do that. John, I know you have a very brief question. I will allow it very briefly, please, John. It's more than a statement. It, yeah. With four weeks to go, we're not worried about the no vote. We get the undecided vote of one. Um, we'll, we'll find out the reasons afterwards. But if you've got people who are definitely no, go on to the next one. As someone who's tasked with getting the vote out, we have lots of groups. This is a big, big umbrella. This yes umbrella. They emphasise it's not the SNP, and I'm an SNP member. There are a myriad of groups out here that are all fighting for the same thing. They all have the right to have people uh, going to doors, getting people out, um, the, the knock-up, the, the undecided vote. We are really getting into gear for winning. Just believe. I like it. I like it. Thank you, John. On that note, Bob's told us to go for it. John's told us to go for it. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed uh, this evening. Um, thank you, all of you, for uh, coming along this evening. And thank you to those who are watching at home, particularly those in Wales. And you're more than welcome to come to Scotland if you fancy a holiday between now and the 18th of September. <laughs> I understand there may be uh, a few. We are keeping John for the next four weeks, I understand. <laughs> um, so um, I, would, I would just like to thank you um, once again. Uh, thank you very much. Right, Joe. Right, right, right. 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 right.
the big issue we've got is getting accommodation for people, particularly women. So if anyone has any accommodation, we're hoping to offer them it for free. If anyone has a spare bedroom or could put up, particularly a woman, but people, if you could just let them know, cause that's the one thing we really want to get right. We don't want to be saying on the Friday morning, we don't have accommodation for you. So if anyone had knows about any accommodation for the 68th of September or any point after that, if you could just let me know and I'll take the details. Bob, you have an yes, it's just a piece of information. I was <coughs> speaking on the phone this morning to my old friend Tara Galley, who is, many of you will know, is, is a passionate supporter of Scottish independence. I think he will be in Glasgow in early September for the referendum uh, because uh, he's been asked to speak. The Radical Independence Convention is bringing out a collection of the essays of Tom Nairn. And Tom is now too ill to actually, I mean, he never was keen on speaking in the meetings anyway. So Tyler's coming up to speak about that. He's also going to be on Radio 4 Question Time. And they said specifically to them, to him, do you want to talk about Scotland? Okay, he reckons that that's because they don't want to talk about Gaza. But, uh, so Tarek is going to be coming back. He did a splendid meeting for us in Kirkcaldy. He did splendid meetings in Glasgow and Edinburgh. Uh, a couple of months ago, so he will be back here helping us to campaign, and, and uh, he his, his meeting in Kirkcaldy, which I don't believe you can still get online, he spoke very interestingly and carefully about the international context and implications of Scottish independence in a very thoughtful way. Okay, thank you. Join your team in the front, yeah? Good morning. Yeah, absolutely.